support like the team is in the letter card. So the development of the NLP application is really extremely uh, challenging because the computer studies and the parts to to communicate uh, to them by the programming languages and the programming languages are typically very precise and uh, uh, unambiguous and it is quite high in structure. Okay. Now human speech when when we when we communicate to the computers or other system, right? So the computers should be able to understand what we are trying to say. Right? The linguistic expertise is very scarce and uh, it was very difficult to find the linguistic piece. There are uh, obviously yeah you can see my presentation right? Yes no I just want the participants for the thought. Right. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, since the linguistic expertise or to understand the language represented in a, in a certain comma, so that computer programs can understand the command and understand the structure of the sentence and take a decision on our behalf in performing certain tasks. That's why we would need linguistic expertise. Now, since the, the resources are very scarce and it's very really difficult to find and also to train such people to come up to speed also it takes time. The learning curve is very steep. So in order to fill this gap, we need to train certain deep learning models or a neural network models where we can create trainable systems, we can create trainable models. With the help of linguistic experts, we can create certain trainable models, we can label the data create a model, then do the transfer learning. We can we can move that model from one domain to another domain and train multiple people or apply the same kind of models in different other scenarios as well. So the deep learning models that capture the nuances of the, the linguistics, for example, it's a combination of various words and its meaning. Right? So what we, what do we need? There are three things that we're we going to need. First one is a well-designed system. Your architecture should be represented in a proper way so that your model should be trained properly. If a poorly designed architecture is not going to help us in interpreting the results or in interpreting the outcome from any kind of deep learning models. Number one. Number two, a perfect labeling. A labeling exercise. If we if we do uh, like two or labeling in the image health steps, it's not going to help us in producing the required output. So what we need is data labeling should be correct. Data labeling should be accurate. And finally, it's all about training. We need uh, a good uh, number of iterations when we train the model. Probably some sometimes this where we may need the uh, uh, reinforcement learning so that we can provide a feedback mechanism. We can provide a, some kind of inputs to the trainable model to make it better. Right. However. What we see in today's world is like if you divide the total number of tasks, it can be broken into micro level and micro level tasks. When NLP first came into picture, like people started using for very specific or as I would suggest like a couple of tasks. I mean uh, only for sentiment analysis, doing a topic modeling, or probably kind of text classification. And gradually, when we get into the nuances of our natural language processing, we got to know various other tasks as well. Because here, when you are performing the micro level tasks, for example, you are doing a topic modeling. What are the techniques that are available in performing a topic modeling? Right? So we could do a, a matrix factorization method, or we can do like a, a support vector machine, or we can use the LSA models, latent semantic, or LDA models. We can do however, if the output is not acceptable to the end user. So what is the next step? How do we take it forward? How do we how do we make it more intuitive so that the the insight users or the business users they should be able to understand what we are trying to convey? Here comes then the role of why the results are not acceptable, why the results are not coming out correctly. Right? Can you go to the previous slide, please? Yeah. So text summarization, if we look at what is text summarization, so it's a process of summarizing a paragraph or summarizing uh, uh, particularly a page and giving the essence of that page. If I have a PDF file, I have one page where I have like 3,000 words. Can I represent it, can I summarize it in 
probably 200 words. If I have 2000, can I reduce it to 200? A text summarization is about telling the things, telling the abstract of what is there, what is written over that page. When you look at sentiment analysis, that's another task which is actually uh, frequently used across different industries to really understand how my customer is happy and unhappy or to what extent happy, what extent unhappy. Initially, people started using the lexicon based approaches. Lexicon based approaches and it has certain limitations. There are two different methods. So, uh, the methods are probably like you can take a, a, a dictionary based approach where you can have uh, the uh, exactly the positive and the negative and the neutral level attached to it. You just count the number of positive words, negative words in a particular sentence, and then you can come up with whether the natural result is positive or negative. Right? However, this task uh, or this method of arriving at sentiment analysis has certain limitations. Correct uh, sentences and a set of correct sentences. 
So if you have input and output, you can train a deep learning model over there. There are obviously different uh, uh, models we currently using to arrive at this, so that automatically the grammar correction can happen. Right? So those models could be uh, some people are using the pre-trained model, some people are using sequence tagging, using the XLNet and the BERT model. And along with that, they are also using some kind of LMO pre models. But obviously, this this just requires more innovation should go there, more fine tuning should happen. At this level, right now, but it, it is not perfect right now, right? When you look at coherence resolution, which is another micro level task. What is coherence resolution? It's basically the process of collecting the expressions. That refers to probably the same object, right? So when you say co-reference, it would be like let's say program management or uh, project management. Now project and management and program and management are they appearing in a document? Uh, maybe they are they are using alternatively. The author is using them alternatively in their document. So if we understand the co-references in a particular context, it makes our life easier so that we don't have to pass them separately in order to build and next. If those tokens are tokens are typically the keywords, if the keywords are being split while understanding the core references, and if it is if it is getting split, then it will create or it will bring more ambiguity in your understanding process about the text. If you can identify them correctly, then it is quite easier to have the context in place and understand it better. Right? Similarly, dependency parsing is another important point in, uh, in in natural language processing. Dependency parsing is about understanding the previous word that has a linkage with it. Suppose you can say the United States. States is associated with the United, United is associated with the So it's actually a three token, the United States. Now when you do a dependency parsing, you can find the relationship between that. Right? So if you understand them as three different tokens, it could lead to three different vectors which will bring in like data sparsity and it could also increase ambiguity in your understanding or training process. So instead of having three tokens, you should have only one vector that in place. Right? So apart from that, there are other tasks also. For example, if you look at a, a task like lexical normalization. Right? What is lexical normalization? So lexical normalization is basically the task that it is a task of translating or transforming a non-standard text to a standard text, right? So lexical normalization is typically uh, a pre-processing technique or pre-processing method, right? A normalization process is only replacement on the word level when you are annotating, right? So either you can do it one minus in the gram replacement or n minus one gram replacement, something like that you can do. But how do I build a, uh, build a system at a scale? So build a system at scale, again, you need to train certain, D, uh, uh, sub certain deep learning models over there, right? So these are uh, tasks, and similarly, if you look at the other components like micro-level lesson prediction or actual level learning, so these are some of the tasks which are uh, recently very much popular because you would have to first resolve those things in order to arrive at the micro-level tasks. If you are not solving these components or these problems, then uh, directly jumping to the macro level task. It could lead to ambiguity, more ambiguity in your text analysis. Okay? We can go to the next slide, please. Fine. So here, when we look at uh, the, uh, the construct of uh, uh, a deep learning system, or we can say the construct of NLP task syntactic. So when you look at the syntaxes, the structure of the sentence, and what are the different uh, different parts of speeches of this particular sentence, and how they are structured, whether it is a verb, noun, noun phrases, etc. Then you go to the semantic structure. Semantics would help you in tasks like, for example, performing the name identity recognition, entity linking, natural language generation, question answering systems and uh, performing probably the semantic learning, right? So these are the tasks that are associated with the process. 
So we have syntactic process, we have semantic process, and we have a discourse analysis. In discourse analysis, how do I do co-reference resolution? The example that I was giving for co-reference resolution. Similarly, the final stage is about the speech, which is the dialect system. The system should be able to understand the speech and should be able to synthesize it, understand the structure of the syntax, and uh, understand the semantics within it, and then provide a discourse on it. Okay. Then go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so this is an example of, uh, uh, though it is for image processing, this is an example of for CNN, which stands for Convolutional Neural Network. And we can we can see the convolutional neural network can be used in the neural network uh, tasks or in performing the uh, NLP related tasks, right? So what is CNN? Typically, uh, uh, the, the neural network is basically uh, it has certain, uh, it can define the neural network as having a system where you have input layer, you have output layer, and you have a bunch of hidden layers to the data. So, the convolutional neural networks are very similar to the ordinary neural networks. However, in convolutional neural networks, the first step or the main difference is the number of layers. CNN are just several layers of a convolution with non-linear activation functions that are applied to the results. And the important aspect of convolutional neural network is that the use of the polling layer, typically which are applied after the convolutional layer, and those polling layers basically subsample the input layer. The most common way to perform the polling is to apply the max polling operation to the result of each filter. The small square box that you see in the polling layer, these are called the filter boxes, right? And when you apply this, the pooling process can also be applied over different windows. You can take different window based process. And here the objective of bringing the convolution layer and the pooling layer is to reduce the dimensions, do right subsampling and represent the data in the right way for the fully connected layer. The objective of a fully connected layer is to train the neural network model. Once you apply the convolutions and then you apply the pooling layer, you can bring down the dimensions and represent the data in a like a feature representation you can do a better way. Then you can train a simple neural network at the fully connected layer. Then you can produce the output. Here this is an example of an image processing. However, the next slide you can see an example of a text. In a text processing, how exactly it happens. So you have a sentence like you should listen to your dance, so for example, one sentence is there. If I vectorize it so you can see the dimensions there are five different dimensions and uh, and those uh, words that are being subsampled and there are total six different filters that you can see. Right? From each of the filters, these filters are basically they are capturing one component or one square part of the feature uh, the raw data. Then you are representing it in a uh, in a small square box as the filters. From each filter when you are applying the polling layer you are narrowing down to one vector. Then after the max pooling vector, either you are applying a transformation function which is called the softmax function. Using the softmax function, you are predicting the probabilities of different two classes. So when you look at the overall flow here, you have a sentence mark uh, metric. From the sentence metric, you are creating a convolution layer. From the convolution layer, you are finding out three region sizes, which is like two plus three plus four. Then you are applying this filter to narrow down and bring it back to or represent it in a feature map. You have two feature maps, two feature maps for each region size, and then you are applying max pooling to arrive at six univariate vectors, which are again concatenated together to form a single feature vector. Then you are training a neural network model to arrive at or to predict the two classes. And this neural network you can have a soft back layer there. And then you are, uh, and this, this architecture you are training again and again, right? So the idea behind uh, bringing the CNN or convolutional neural networks for text classification is that usually when when you have uh, the input sentences which are quite uh, imbalanced, for example, each sentence will not have similar length. One sentence can be having 20 words, other sentence can be having 50 words, next sentence can be having five words. So that is huge sparsity in the data. So 
Typically, when you are training, let's take a, a research paper and in classification of research papers into different subjects, if that's a huge case for you, each sentence in or in a, each paragraph in the research paper would be of a different size. So, given the different size of the sentences, your data sparsity would increase. Now, in order to represent the uh, the vector or in order to represent the data in a proper way, you can bring in the CNLs or the convolutional neural networks to reduce the dimension, train the data, and perform the classification model. Right? So, when you look at uh, the advanced model, and you can also apply a combination of uh, CNN and RNN. If you are using a combination, that would be like RCNN. And right? the in convolutional neural network, you can use. Okay? So, when you are looking at uh, the RNN, there can be two different variations of it. One can be bidirectional RNN, the other can be using a, a deep recurrent neural network. The, either you can use a recurrent neural network or you can use a recursive neural network, both there is a difference between the two. Recursive neural network like one output, one uh, output from one layer can be fed as input to the next layer. Okay? So, you can use both kinds of architectures and personally when to use what? If you have Huge sentences like your large sentences with uh, more words and data capacity there, you should go for deep RCNN. Right? And if it is like a, a tweet or it could be a, a customer review or feedback, you could use the bidirectional RNN as well. However, if you want to carry the uh, like uh, uh, the feature from one step to other step, right? So which is called applying uh, LSTM. Right. What is LSTM? Long short term memory network. Right? Now, where we would need the LSTM and why do we need the LSTM networks? In RNN, typical problem is that so there are two kinds of problems excluding gradient problem and vanishing gradient problem. When you are training RNN networks, usually it happens to so RNN is basically the general architecture. To so model the distributed representations of a phrase or a sentence with its dependency tree. Right. So it can be uh, considered as a, like a semantic modeling of a text sequences, or it can you can handle the input sequences of various length into kind of like a fixed length vector. But the parameters of RCNN can be learned jointly with some other or uh, some other uh, NLP tasks, for example, like a uh, like text classification. However, the limitation is that either the gradients when you are optimizing is getting vanished or sometimes the gradients are getting excluded. Because of those two limitations, you can switch back to the LSTM network you should consider training the memory network. The memory in LSTM are called basically the cells. So you can think of them as like kind of like black boxes that take some input of the previous state and the current input. So internally those cells decide what to keep in memory and what to forget. So you can see here on the left side graph you can see you have input gate, you have forget gate, you have uh, output gate. Within this you can find the memory cell input and the memory cell output. Right? So when we train in like internally those cells decide what to keep, what to delete or erase from the learning process from the memory. Then they combine the previous state and the current memory and the new input. It turns out that these type of units are very efficient in capturing the long-term dependencies between the token in one particular sentence. Right? So the dependency-based neural networks, for example, this kind of LSTM-based model. So on the right hand side you can see this is a sample architecture where you can see the input is broken into or vectorized and this has been fed to Create an embedded matrix. The embedded matrices have nothing but the word embedding. I'll talk about the word embedding next as well. So then this embedded matrix can be fed to the LSTM layer. The LSTM layer is nothing but the memory cells. And from LSTM layer, you are taking the uh, data to the uh, hidden layer. And after hidden layer, you can change a neural network there to produce the final output. Okay. You can go to the next slide. Hello. Right. Now this is 
So this is called the recursive uh, neural network where in this uh, recursive neural network what happens uh, uh, when you are training uh, a deep learning model over here. Okay? A recursive neural network is again a deep, uh, it's a special type of uh, deep neural network which is created by applying the same set of weights to return to the over the structure. The structure is defined over here. Right? So to produce a structure prediction over the input or basically a scalar prediction on it. And this is done by traversing through a topological order. So this is the topological order. You have word embedding, you have distant embedding, then you have a convolution layer, then you can apply the max pulling layer. So this is structured in a very hierarchical way. There's a recursive, there's a recursive neural network. Uh, so they typically uh, being used when there is a dependency between various tokens. When when you are uh, when you are trying to understand maybe uh, text classification or sentiment analysis, there is a long range dependency, and those dependency tokens they constitute one entity. Then you should be using those kind of recursive neural networks, right? Yeah, so this is one example of the dependency. There are various tools that are available today. You can use Google NLP, you can use the Spacey, you can use text blog. And uh, uh, on those APIs, they have APIs and you can just pull those APIs to create a dependency. Here, you can define what are the dependencies, like key. So security is like a character dependency. You can do a word dependency as well, right? So. The word dependency and the character level dependency also, both can be combined together to produce greater results. Okay. Can you go to the next slide, please? This is another uh, representation of a word embedding. So word embeddings are uh, nothing but uh, identifying the relevant features from the data. Okay. So this construct explains the lexical level representations. What is lexical? level representation or how those lexical level representations can be used for deep learning related tasks, right? So this is basically uh, nothing but the ranking process. You have one embedding layer, then from the center, you can get the feature input, you can train, create feature maps to a conventional layer, and you can apply max pulling over there, you can produce the classifier output. Two kinds of representation you can do. Either you can do a sentence level feature extraction, you can do a lexical level feature representation. Sentence level feature extraction, sometimes it is like quite, uh, you can say, it's very, very generic. But when you are going for lexical based uh, uh, representation or sentence uh, construction or representation, right? So lexical level is very, like, it's like a dynamic multipling network, right? So this helps you in capturing more context than the sentence level. And what are the tasks where you should, you should use it? Short uh, text categorization. For example, tweet. If you want to classify the tweet, right? If you want to do a semantic clustering, now you have short range sentences, you want to do a semantic clustering. So these are the tasks where this lexical level data representation typically helps. Okay? Can I go to the next slide, please? Yeah, this is a scoring mechanism and this is used typically for uh, question answering systems. In, in creating a question answering system first, you have the shared representations of the words. One word can be part of multiple entities. And you can combine those words to create composite vectors. Then those composite vectors you can put it in a convolutional layer, then perform the max pulling to train the model and then you can create the answer part, answer context and answer type also. Right? So this is called multi-column network. You have three different uh, layers here. The shared word representation you can achieve by doing word embedding and this kind of architecture or this kind of multi-column network architecture, this is typically very much useful for text summarization. Where when you are drawing a summary from one page, that is like 2,000 words to 200 words summary, then one word can be part of many sentences, one word can be part of many uh, like 4 gram, 5, five gram token, right? So then in order to produce the better result, and this is also uh, used for 
uh, the machine chart is not there. And yeah. can you please go to the next slide? This is another structure where it is similar, but it is derived from the previous graph where you can do relational representation. So relational representation means context dependent network. What is context dependent network? So context is basically combination of various words if I combine together. It has a meaning for the analysis. It could be text summarization, it could be sentiment analysis. So context is important. Random words and if I join them, that's not context. The context should be conveying some meaning. Context should be so and this, this kind of a context dependent network can be used for uh, let's say tasks like uh, topic modeling. Right. So you can have representation. Now, this, what is common across uh, or those different architectures or those different models that we are going to talk about? Carefully chosen architecture. Which layer? Where to put what kind of uh, uh, architecture? Whether it is DNN or it is RNN or it is LSTM or whether it is a combination of both. If it's a combination, what to apply when? Right. So it's basically carefully chosen. Of uh, uh, like uh, architecture that gives you better result, right? And this context-dependent network is also useful. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, this context-dependent network can be useful in your paraphrase generation. What is paraphrase? So paraphrase refers to basically the text that convey the similar meaning, right? You can you can choose different combinations of words or you can uh, replace or probably shuffle their places in the sentence, right? You should you should replace it in such a way that the meaning of both the sentences should be same. It should not be different. So you could say, okay, uh, how far is Delhi from uh, Mumbai, right? How far is Delhi from Mumbai? You can say, right? You could you could write the same sentence as, what is the distance between Delhi and Mumbai, right? So typically you are probably using the similar kind of word, however there is one replacement, right? Or one addition, one deletion, and one replacement. So how is it getting replaced by what, right? And your addition is the distance and the between, right? And there is one addition it could be from. So you can have the similar meaning, you can convey the similar meaning by Choosing different words and then shuffle certain position. Maybe you can choose uh, or consider adding certain words or deleting certain words. So the paraphrase generation typically uh, uh, helps in like content preparation. People who are writers, uh, they're writing blogs, articles, etc. So sometimes in order to avoid the plagiarism concepts, you can you can look for applications. That produce paraphrases. So, paraphrase generation refers to a task in which a given sentence, right, to the system, it can create different other sentences automatically, which can have or which should have similar meaning or exactly similar meaning, right. So, this is an important task in NLP, right. Now, the next step is about transfer learning. Right. What is transfer learning? Transfer learning is nothing but you are training a model in a context or in a scenario and you are applying the same model in other scenarios. That's basically your transfer learning in a very simplified way or in a very simple uh, 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 sentence I can say. However, it's not that easy because your choice of the word or the sentences that are being trained in one scenario is quite different from the other, right? So how do we generalize them? How do we generalize the the, uh, the training process? So typically there are two kinds of systems which are in place today, and you can see transfer learning or or, or can be executed in multiple ways. You can use LSTM models to do that. You can use transformers to do that. You can use the recurrent transformers also to perform that. And all those things you can do. However, when you have, uh, uh, like, let's take an example of a transfer learning could be uh, name identity recognition or parts of speech identification, 
or it could be a continent classification or it could be topic modeling right you can try a topic modeling by taking news article right you can apply the same thing here in customer reviews can that be done right so traditionally the nlp models were changed after like the some random initialization of model parameters or ways the transfer learning basically used as a technique where the neural network that you have trained is fine-tuned on a specific task after being pre-trained on a general task. Right? So you can train on DBpedia data or you can train on Wikipedia data. Then you can apply it on uh, different like customer interactions data set. You can apply the same models on uh, other data sets could be like performing classification or identifying the complaints, the type of complaints from customer uh, reviews or uh, similar kind of use cases. However, it is not very straightforward. Sometimes it, it requires NLP expertise in fine-tuning the pre-trained model as well. Sometimes you can take the last, uh, the fully connected layer, you can, you can take it out. You can read up to the, uh, the convolution, the final convolution layer and max fully clear. Then if you want to retrain the final fully connected layer, you can retrain it. If no retraining required, you can directly use it. Right? So the transfer learning can be used for applications where there is a lack of training data. Large training data is not available. Right? So then the target data set should ideally be related in some sense to the pre-trained data set. And think about like Quora question answering system, sample question answering data set. There are data sets related to uh, some other domains as well. Right? So you have to use the domain uh, is very important. There has to be some relationship between the two. Right? And if there is no relationship at all, and your transfer model or transfer learning model is not going to work. Right? And at the same time, the vanilla models, the simple neural network models, or simple uh, uh, this recurrent neural network models or recursive neural network models, these are not going to work. What is going to work is carefully architected a transformer model, which is like a combination of LSTM models you could use, where you can provide attention to certain layers. Those attentions can be, you can create some gated recurrent uh, GL models, like gated recurrent neural network models, where at every layer, you can evaluate the outcome. If the outcome is acceptable or not acceptable, you can provide the feedback there. And if it is required, fine tune the weights further to arrive at the final outcome. Right? That's why attention mechanism is very important. Instead of encoding a single vector, represent the entire sequence of words, the attention mechanism basically computes the context vector. The context vector could be a combination of words. It can be a trigram, it can be a foregram, it can be a noun phrase, or it can be a verb phrase. Right? So the decoder again computes the relevance score for all those context vectors that you are providing. And these scores are then normalized by performing a softmax layer. The so softmax layer basically operates by providing the probability so that you can, you can obtain the attention weights. Now, of these weights you can use to perform the way it's some of the encoder states, right? We'll go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is this slide is talking about the difference between the machine learning and the deep learning approach of doing pre processing, feature extraction, modeling. So, this is like a sentiment example you can see on the slide. But this can be extended to any kind of classification. It can be binary classification, it can be multi class classification, any kind of classification. It could be used for like a text to text classification. You have input as text, your output is also another document as text. You could extend this to that also, right? However, the choice of a network is going to change. If your input sentence is small, medium, or large, and your output is whether it is finite, small, or it is large, having more classes, or it's a document, the choice of algorithms are going to change. Certain pre-processing text also pre-processing steps are also going to change, right? But what is common is that sometimes the pre-processing tasks are not uniform across different networks. 
sometimes you would be doing the uh, maybe if you look at the tokenization, then apply lemmatization, then do stemming. Probably you don't need stemming and lemmatization in some of the terms. Right? Now you need to identify where stemming is required, where lemmatization is required. Should we do stemming? Now if your context, for example, a use case, you have a context uh, recognition is the key, you should keep the data as it is. You should not do any kind of lemmatization of stemming. Why? Because it can be, let's take a, a machine learning and the machine learns. Both are different. If you apply training, learning and learns both will change. However, the meaning of both the words are different. And if you want to retain the context, machine learns and learning both are different. You, if you want to separately recognize them, you should not do lemmatization or training as a pre-processing technique. You leave it as it is. Right? And if you are not uh, doing that, your final outcome could be different. Right? And go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so that's all. If you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, hi, Vibhika. I think you covered various aspects of NLP. And those who are asking questions, uh, there are many questions. Because of the positive mm -hmm. time, we will take maybe two questions. One is uh, sure. one of the questions now. Uh, this thing is uh, that uh, what happened to the words in the test focus? They are not available on the train or? Right. Good question. So sometimes, yes. When you are training uh, like a deep learning model, your tokens that are not part of uh, the training uh, that are present in text or vice versa. This could be happening, right? So this, this is typically a problem when you are looking at unigram vector training. However, when you, when you create a context vector, so there are two, three options here. Either you can go for uh, like a unigram test vector and features, right? That's one. Number two, a phrase based approach, like a noun phrase and a verb phrase. Number three, looking at uh, maybe bag of words approach. And number four, identifying the context vector. When you are going for a context vector, these kind of problems will not arise. That's number one. Number two, when you are creating training test split. First, you take the list of unique words that are present in your training case, make sure that those words should be part of, like at least 80% of those words should be part of the test set. And how to do that? Instead of doing a random, a random sampling, you should go for shuffling, like stratified sampling. At least those vectors, some part of those vectors should be present in the test set. However, still uh, apart from that, also you still find some words which are part of your uh, 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 test set which is not present in the training set, but if it is a part of a context vector, that would be covered pretty well. Uh, there is another question from Sarah Sarah. Uh, what about uh, I think uh, production? The term is correct. What the software is uh, in India production? I am not very really sure about this question. Uh, yeah, yeah right, right, right. So it could be a question of like, uh, what are the softwares that are being uh, used in production scenario, right? Is that the question? Well, the software is in, uh, okay, production. I think uh, there is a spelling. Right. Software that are being used in the production, so there are two prominent uh, software. Uh, I mean, uh, space is mostly used uh, in, in today's world. And uh, the species is also quite an intelligent uh, in comparison to uh, as it was uh, like two years back. Because recently they adopted the, the BERT provided by Google and uh, they are using BERT in the behind the scenes to train the model and uh, make uh, uh, intelligent predictions, whether it is UN, whether it is language models, identification of, of, of phrases like verb phrases, noun phrases. Almost all the tasks that are uh, uh, being spaces is being used today, right? Uh, it's like better, this or better. So that's why uh, today uh, mostly spaces is used for production scenarios where you don't have a dependency on any particular task. Now, if you are using a specific task uh, for a specific task for a specific stack, for example, the Google uh, stack you are using for development, then you could go for Google NLP. 
if you are using the AWS stack for deployment, you have, you have a choice. You can go for staging, or you can go for the uh, the NLP tool. There is a uh, inbuilt NLP tool to use AWS stack. Well. You can use that, right? So yeah, but mostly uh, basic enterprise version is being used in platform scenarios. So how do you apply language modeling in closed language information? Sorry? How do you apply language modeling in closed language information? That is kind of like, uh, yeah, that is I think what much in class with you are talking about, right? Yes. So cross language, yeah, so that is uh, still typically a challenge, so it is not yet solved. And uh, the language model is really uh, like a uh, machine translator, I think it means like a corpus. And uh, the variations of the corpus variations are also very, very important, right? So uh, the the bilingual sentences, for example, you have uh, like English to French or French to English. So these kind of a combination of different uh, uh, sentences and the corpus, that's the key, right? And it requires a lot of back and forth to validations as well. So it's not a very straightforward and there is no a pocket system right now. And uh, to some extent, Google Translation also resolving it right now because Google Translation evolved over years and they have a huge corpus which is getting trained. So you can see uh, the results little better, but uh, there is a challenge in, in machine translation. There are two kinds of uh, translation you can produce, literal translation and context-aware translation. Literal translation you can still achieve. Because you can directly put the word and get the corresponding word and replace it. However, how to make the context aware uh, translation, that is the too difficult for machines to solve right now. Yeah, okay. I think, yeah. So, thank you so much. And uh, we just want to take a minute also to run quickly on our program on MSEC in AI, where text analytics and its applications are one of the focus area of our research here. These programs are typically customized for people who are already in data science and working on some of these models to get on to more of research driven, patient driven applications. So that is the purpose of running these MTech program in AI. Uh, and uh, as Padita mentioned, there are many challenges that we are trying to tackle here as well. Uh, starting with uh, uh, a typical uh, even a human system who understands the context onward. So machine translation, we, we work on some of the language translation uh, projects here. So there are multiple focus areas, uh, one being text analytics and NLP, other being video and image analytics, analytics as well as well. So there are multiple projects that which would, uh, finally you will get hands-on understanding on this, uh, especially when you are doing this AI program. Uh, we use Series of industry grade uh, projects with a uh, set of uh, uh, techniques and tools that are available for industry production. And uh, yeah, so this is, this is a glimpse uh, of what we provide in this MTEC program or a PG diploma program. And uh, we have a very dedicated uh, built lab to actually work on this technology. And you are welcome to visit our lab as well as interact with our mentors uh, like Pradipta and please connect with us and a few of our uh, numbers are here. You can always talk to us and to understand more. And I would take a minute to thank uh, Pradipta to actually dwell upon a very complex set of areas with multiple applications but, uh, but in a very, very brief and succinct way that we uh, move from basic uh, text analytics projects to say including say context driven uh, transfer learning mechanisms and uh, he covered different topics as well as technology architecture and this thing. We can't thank you enough Patita for coming uh, and helping us with this webinar and I'm sure a lot of participants were part of this have benefited immensely from this. It's a knowledge session only. Uh, if you are interested to have hands-on understanding on our program and have practical learning or workshop or attend some of the boot camps that we run in a closed circuit, 
things connect to us and then we would be happy to catch them in touch. So, Tadita, uh, any last thoughts that where, uh, where do you see? Because you, you are, some of your products are uh, deeply involved in uh, uh, NLP based techniques. So, where do you see the industry is going and what are the careers uh, that uh, people can look at after maybe taking our program or maybe understanding NLP? Yeah. Right, right. So there are so many, uh, so many things, there are so many work is happening around things in NLP area, especially uh, like uh, as I showed in the second slide onwards, so you have micro level tasks and you have micro level tasks. Now here from micro level, we'll, we can go further like super micro level tasks. Like it could be uh, correcting the spelling. And there could be like uh, automatically correcting the, the grammar in the sentences. It could be identifying the maybe the pronunciations could be integrated for people to learn. Like maybe kids, uh, we can create products like that, like the uh, proper pronunciation for different words that can be integrated. So there are so many opportunities around that. Uh, uh, like creating NLP products and creating NLP solutions. So it, it's, a, it's a very uh, emerging field and a few years back uh, it was only, uh, you can see text classification, sentiment analysis. Now you can see many more applications around it and in, like as the development happens, innovation also happens side by side, right? So translation was impossible a couple of years back. And then uh, literal translation, which is like a word to word exact translation happened. Now to some extent it is context aware. It is not fully context aware. Maybe in, in few years down the line we can see completely context aware uh, translation engines develop. And mostly now translation engines are developed by large companies. Now it can come up as a social product as well. Similarly, translation to vernacular languages, local languages that design languages, those things would also come in in future. So a lot more development is happening around this and uh, you can see uh, many research papers that are being produced. And you, you can see uh, a dashboard like uh, Spot, it's a uh, uh, Stanford question answering um, a data set and it's dashboard. So the machine learning models are, are really performing better in terms of reading comprehension and related activities and the Performance is as well with humans, uh, human level of uh, uh, like articulating the sentence. Similarly, there are, I mean, you can see models will be coming closer to human performance over the years. Now that kind of thing you will see in the digital automate and the way we think the way we perform that, that there is like huge opportunity, huge opportunity. Great. So we are, we are equally excited and looking at the multiple projects and opportunities in research, especially in uh, using NLP. And we are hoping under the Reva Academy for Corporate Excellence and Race Labs as well, and Reva University, we would want to catalyze that research uh, with the help of all the research that we have got And uh, since the time is up and we have actually closed almost 15 plus minutes, uh, so we would want to thank you again, Sadita, for coming over and enlightening and inspiring. I hope this presentation would have inspired you to go back and check some of the links being shared here as well as connect with Sadita or with us, any of us, and then understand the, the possibilities that you can get in and change your career. So uh, we thank everyone for patiently uh, listening as well as uh, for questions and interacting with us. Thank you everyone and have a good night and stay safe.